Hello, good morning. Welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. We are on to episode 148 uh, of the Learn with Lorna series. If you haven't watched before, my name is Lorna Steele McGinn and the Community Engagement Officer for the Highland Archive Service. So my job involves anything at all that engages, engages people and connects people to all the varied collections that we hold. We have four archive centres across the Highlands of Scotland, one in Inverness, one in Portree, one in Fort William and one in Wick. And together the four of them look after the historic document collections for the Highlands of Scotland. This series is brought to you by Highlife Highland at no cost to the viewer. Highlife Highland is our umbrella organisation that runs um, leisure and sports and cultural activities on behalf of the Highland Council. Highlife Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then please do so. And we're very, very grateful for that. And I'm aware that uh, money is tight for everybody. <laughs> so we're into the last month of Learn with Lorna before we take the summer break. And we're looking this week at occupations. And this is uh, going to be a really lighthearted kind of, there's, there's no huge in-depth knowledge in this one. Um, it was really because I started to think that I've spoken about poets, I've spoken about artists, I've spoken about uh, farmers and all sorts of different people. And then I thought that the subject of occupations itself is just quite interesting. Um, so it's, I, I had quite a lot of fun putting this one together. References to occupations are some of my favourite things to come across. And I'm sure that other people feel this as well. If you've done any family history research or anything like that and you've come across some, then do put them in the chat and I'll pick them up as I'm talking. But I love coming across um, different archives that and interesting names, as you know, because I've mentioned that many times over the years. Um, so, for instance, in my family tree, this is going to be a big list, OK? I have ammunition factory foremen, coal miners, engineers, missionaries, stonemason, stonemasons, agricultural labourers, shepherds, musicians, dressmakers, chimney sweeps, milliners, coal porters, tailors, needlewomen, cordoners, gardeners, labourers, rugby players, and I'll come back to a bit more about some of those. Not my own family, but just some of those jobs. I even have someone in my family tree who worked at the Royal Mint, but I have to say that turned out to be infinitely less exciting than I expected. Um, but I, I've, I've kind of started with that because I think it's a typical example of any family tree. You'll look at a family that will have a, a mixture of jobs, even your immediate family probably, um, a mixture of jobs and some that are still common. So for instance, there I said engineers, but some that are less common, like, um, let me see, what, what's a good example? Chimney sweeps now are not that common, um, although they still exist, and then some that don't exist at all anymore. So most families will probably have a mixture like that within their uh, their family tree, although there are undoubtedly patterns within families. So if you think of some of the episodes we've done of this before, like the Sage Sutherland family with all of their ministers, or the Maclean family of Rassi with all of the folklorists in there. So there's no doubt that family businesses or the impact of, of being brought up immersed by a certain profession can have an effect on a family. So for instance, in my family, there's about a hundred years of chimney sweeps in one line, um, all at one address, just handing the trade and the skills and the business down and down and down. And often I think that's where people's interest in occupations comes from. They found a reference in a document or in a family tree and gone, oh, I wonder what that involved. Um, the other thing I find interesting is, so like that line of family of uh, chimney sweeps in my family, over the over the census years, that, that there's a, dis a change in the way that's described. So there are, first of all, they're described as sweeps, then they're described as chimney sweepers, then they're described as master sweeps, and then there's chimney cleaning operatives as the years change. And so the census can document the change in a profession. So I wanted to look at some examples of those most common places that we, we come across those references, census records and birth, marriage and death. So if you look at census, as I say, it can give a snapshot of the social, the social history of an area as well as of a family. So, and incidentally, you can sometimes come across collaborated, uh, a, a kind of collated data after a census as well. So there's a fantastic website and I'll put a link up to some of the websites that I'll mention 
um, which has the occupation lists gathered and, and collated after each census, and that's really interesting. So the census can often show patterns, not just in families, as I say, but in areas. Much like statistical accounts will show details of the areas that people are working in. So, for instance, if you look at the census for somewhere like Wick or uh, Ullapool or Helmsdale, then you're probably going to find numerous fishermen. And I found fishermen and fisherwomen alongside the associated trades. So you'll also find all the other things that are supporting that economy. So coopers, gutters, boat builders, sail makers, curers, all sorts of things like that. And of course, many of the people who are working in... Um, particularly in the earlier years of the, of the census, they're doing a bit of everything. If they work in a fishing village or something, they might be a fisherman most of the time, but they're going to have a finger in all of those different areas and be able to, to, to take part in a lot of things. So jobs are much less clear cut. So for instance, this is an extract uh, from the notes sent to me by the team at Nucleus about uh, a, a, the job book of a boat builder. And they've written, not all jobs were as simple as their title suggests, like this job book of John Robertson Bruce, boat builder in Wick, shows. John Robertson Bruce, born 1902, died 1965, was technically called a boat builder. He was employed by Donald Alexander in his yard at Martha Terrace, Wick, both pre and post World War II. He built many fishing vessels for the local fleet and large numbers of smaller pleasure craft, especially loch boats. The yard closed in mid 1950s and John struck out on his own. He still carried out some work on local boats, but expanded into using those skills to work on houses and on local estates. He kept a logbook of all the work he had carried out, materials supplied, accounts charged and payments received. Most of the work done was on boats still, repairing, repainting, cleaning, making new oars. But some of his work began to include odd jobs like making and fitting shelves for vans or repairing ladders for painters or working on houses, repairing the glass in windows, varnishing doors and so on. So you'll see that a lot of people having a specific skill set and then going, well, where else can I use that? Particularly if the industry that they've learned those skills in is in decline. So that's the sort of thing you might see in, as I say, somewhere coastal like Wick or Alapool. Whereas if you go somewhere like uh, inland, like um, one of the inland Nairnshire parishes, for instance, like Ardclach, um, you'll feel you'll find jobs associated with the land um, and I was so pleased when I had this and I was putting that together and I thought yeah that's the bulk of what you're going to find there and then I did a kind of random dip in the census to check what my th my thoughts were and I was very relieved to find that almost every one I opened was a farmer or an agricultural labourer, farm servant, shepherds, gamekeepers, crofters, ploughmen, things like that. Um, so you can see an occupational pattern using the census. You also find a lot of people listed uh, as wife of whatever it might be. So you, you'll find farmer's wife or I found one family that was farmer's wife, farmer's son, farmer's daughter, farmer's daughter, farmer's daughter. Was, okay. Um, so in uh, kind of in relation to what's seen as the, the, the main job of the family. And then of course across the Highlands and Islands you're going to find those kind of non-area specific roles. In every area you'll find the jobs that are needed to keep the, the country running, basically to keep the area running. So you'll find teachers, drapers, clerks, um, masons, doctors, tailors, millers, blacksmiths, things like that, um, merchants and carters, people who are, as I say, making, making the system work, making it possible to live. Um, and a lot of those are jobs I think now that people lament the loss of. So things like um, like the, those kind of the smiths and the, the makers, the people who are producing products, I think sometimes um, those are the jobs that people are, are saddened that, that we don't have as much of them anymore. If you go to somewhere like one of the large houses, of course, then you can see a wide range of occupations within one house. So, for instance, I went to look at the Dunrobin Castle census for the 1861 uh, census and I found that there were gate porters, housekeepers, master gardeners and other gardeners, housemaids, still room maids, dairy maids, steelmen, coachmen, porters, farm managers. So you've got those inside jobs and then in the surrounding areas around the castle, there's farm managers, poultry keepers, greaves, cattlemen. 
and all of those kind of jobs keeping the establishment running. Other big houses, because I had a, a dip through various different uh, uh, big houses that I could um, that I could think of. I went to see what what they had, and so you'll often also find things like cooks and footmen and ladies' maids and butlers and laundresses and governesses and nursery maids and scullery maids and all those sorts of uh, sorts of jobs. And all of those kind of occupations are looking after those whose occupation is usually listed as something like landed proprietor or I found one, Peer's daughter is her occupation. Also, I found some, um, s quite a few people who are listed as, their, their occupation is listed as interest off money. So they're being able to live off the interest of the money that they have. That was the Glanders of Highfield family that I saw that in. You can also see um, by using these records, how many of those kind of higher ranking domestic servants moved about. So, for instance, if you look at the 1881 census, you can see that Robert Jeffrey, who's aged 31, was the butler at Leys Castle near Inverness. And it shows that he and his wife had come from Stobo in Peeblesshire, where their son George had been born. Uh, he was three by this point. So have they come because they've worked in another big house? Possibly. Stobo, of course, has a, a, big, a big house. If you look at uh, the, the census for Rosehoch estate, the valet there in 1881 was from Highclere in Hampshire, which of course is a famous big house. And quite often what you'll see is that the housemaids, the grooms, those kind of lower orders of the, of the kind of domestic circle might be local, but the butlers, the governesses will be brought in from elsewhere. Um, so you'll see they might have come in from the south of Scotland, they might have come in from, from England or elsewhere. I, again, I had a I had a feeling that this was true in, in kind of the experience of kind of looking over these things over the years, but I thought I'm going to do a dip test in the census to see if I'm right. Um, and it was really interesting when I looked at the 1881 census, John Miller's household in Thurso contained five members of staff. They're all local, apart from the governess who's come from Edinburgh. In Hill House in Dingwall, all the staff are local, except the governess who was Swiss. In Kinmiley's, she was Australian. I found governesses who were from Germany, from India, from France. Um, in the MacLeod of Cadball house, if you remember, I spoke about the MacLeod of Cadball collection a few weeks ago. The butler was from Yorkshire, the governess is from London, but most of the other staff are, are local. If you go to a house like the Rosehoch, which I mentioned, if you haven't looked up Rosehoch House, then please do. Absolutely stunning building that no longer exists. Um, that was famous for its for its gardens and so it had a head gardener from Wales, a foreman gardener from Perth and then two assistant foreman gardeners and two apprentice foreman gardeners who are local. So again they're using local workforce, local labour but they're bringing in expertise or prestige maybe from elsewhere. Those gardeners who were on the Rosehawk estate lived in the Rosehawk gardener's house really interesting Rosehoch because the many of they, they have many pieces of accommodation like that that go with the jobs so they also had the Rosehoch dairymaid's cottage the Rosehoch farm servants bothy the Rosehoch lodges um the Rosehoch farm greaves house the Rosehoch gamekeepers bothy so those very specific places where those members of staff would live with that tied accommodation and of course there are loads of other occupations that come with tied accommodation, everything from ministers and with manses to teachers and schoolhouses. And again, you can see those in the census or in the valuation rolls or in a range of other documents. Often what's recorded under occupation can reveal quite a lot about someone's social standing and their financial position. So I've mentioned there that there are people who are listed as living off interest from money. But what about the people at the other end of that spectrum? You'll quite often find people on the census or on birth, marriage and death records listed as pauper and pauper will be listed as their occupation. So, for instance, in 1851, this is just me doing a very quick overarching search of Scotland. There were around 41,000 paupers. Now, pauper is someone who is living off uh, support, poor relief support from the system. So some kind of uh, benefits effectively, but it's interesting to me that that's listed under their occupation in the way that you might now say that someone lives off benefits and that's their 
uh, where their income is coming from. It's not that their job is being poor, but it's that that's where the income they have is coming from. Um, and there's no other occupation at the time of the census. You can see something similar with that kind of overarching term with the term Chelsea pensioner. So quite often you'll find someone referred to as a Chelsea pensioner under their occupation. And of course, for those of us, particularly in, in Britain, those of us will picture the Chelsea pensioners in their red coats. But actually anyone who was an army pensioner would be called a Chelsea pensioner. So that will be under occupation because, again, it's showing where the money is coming from that that person is surviving on. Chelsea pensioners and paupers are, are quite common. It's less common to find someone listed as their occupation as tinker. And it was something I found a wee bit upsetting. Not at all the occupation, because tinkers are just people who travelled, who lived in tents or caravans and sold and traded things like tin. But what I found kind of a wee bit emotional about it was seeing for so many of these entries other blank columns. So their occupation was given as tinker. But their first name, their surname, their marital status, their relationships, all of that was either left blank or with NK or not known written on it. And I just wondered, looking at it, whether which way round that was, why that had happened. So is it the fact that the, the person, the enumerator taking the census has gone, if you're a tinker, that's all I need to know about you, that's enough. I don't need any more information about you. Have you categorised them as that? Or has the person decided that they don't want to give that information to the to the system? Um, because sometimes occupations generate opinions both ways. So I just I kind of paused for a moment to wonder why that information was was not there. Who had who'd made that decision? One of the most fascinating things when you're looking at occupations is the way they change through time, as society's needs and society's norms and what each area expects and needs changes. So for instance, there are jobs in our records, whether that's estate records or statistical accounts or any other types of, of archive, that were, would have been very common in the past, but that we don't see anymore. So things like ostlers, state, who are stablemen at a stableman at an inn, a coal porter, who I said I've got in my own family tree, that's someone who travels selling books, particularly religious texts, um, knocker-ups, I love that, um, someone whose job was to go around waking people up, uh, skin dressers, lamp lighters, catechists, that's someone who's instructing in religious doctrine, cowpers, who are cup makers, dexters, who are dyers, blackster, who with an X, blackster, bleacher of cloths, or even jobs that many of you will remember but no longer exist, like telegraphists. The wonderful Margaret MacDougall collection, which I have spoken about uh, on a previous episode, which I, is one of my go-to collections, includes some of her notes on some of the now defunct occupations that used to exist within the borough boundaries. So for instance, there is an extract that she's researched and written about the executioner and what that role involves, which is, it's more than just executing people, it's, but it's equally as unpleasant. Um, the Postmaster of Horse. I, I found that one really interesting, so I'll post that one up when I finish talking, because that, that's quite a, a fascinating one. But this is an extract from her notes about what the, the borough drummer's job was. Every town employed a drummer to beat the drum when proclamations were made or announcements intimated to the townspeople. The services of the drummer were always required for some purpose or another. The town council, when they arrived at some decision affecting the community, issued what was called an act of council. One of the borough officers went to the market cross and read the announcement. The drummer accompanied the borough officer, beating his drum to attract the attention of the people to the intimation. To intimate by tuck of drum was the expression used, and amongst the announcement made with a drummer were the following. The dates of local fairs and markets, changes in the price of, com uh, of um, com commodition, the arrival of the circuit court judge, punishment of criminals and their banishment from the town, arrivals of ships at the harbour, arrivals of stocks of food at the market cross. In September 1737, the drummer was named for Inverness was named MacLeod, 
and he appears to have been a drummer in the army before being employed by the town council. At this time, the council had been sent to London for two drums. They had been dispatched, but the ship carrying them was delayed by contrary winds. The two drums appear to have been kept, one of which was given to the drummer and the other retained in the town clerk's office for extraordinary occasions. And her notes about the drummer carry on to give the list of people who had that role and also details of when the drums were uh, engraved, the silver was engraved with the town coat of arms. So just really interesting, that opening sentence, every town would have had a drummer. Um, totally taken for granted and something that we don't have anymore. So jobs that don't exist anymore, but also many jobs that we still have, but what we call them different names. That's really common. So apothecaries, for instance, or baxters for bakers, fleshers for butchers, um, druggists for chemists, butcher's killer for an abattoir worker, scavengers, which we kind of still say in staying scaffies for the bin men, cordoners were shoemakers, uh, the hammerman, anybody using a hammer or kind of smithing kind of trade, scrivener, somebody who prepares accounts. And then there are local names that maybe those of us in the Highlands or in Scotland will be still t totally familiar with, but people elsewhere might not be. Let me know. Um, so, for instance, the gillies, the people who, whose job is to bring the stags off the hill, the domini, the schoolmaster, or a stravager, and a stravager is a tramp. And one of the other things I really enjoyed finding as I was kind of looking through this was the breakdown in roles that there used to be. So, you know, for instance, we might have now a social, uh, uh, a marketing team where someone's responsibility is social media, someone's is advertising campaigns, someone is, um, I don't know, managing uh, advertising accounts. You know, so you would have a breakdown within that team. But when I had a look at something like iron workers, it shows how many levels of skill and different expertises there were within this. So, for instance, ironmonger, I, when I looked at iron, I found ironmongers, so selling them, iron founders, iron turners, iron dressers, iron moulders, iron puddlers, iron bar rollers, iron manufacturers, iron ore breakers, iron ore wares, iron workers. So you just get a sense of how big that industry was and then, you know, how those the, the change in those industries means that all of those specific skills are possibly not required anymore. And then also you see the different levels frequently. So you'll find a master, so and so like I had a master sweep in my family. Then you'll get a journeyman and a journeyman is someone who is a qualified tradesman and then apprentices and so on. So you can see different levels um, of, of skill and of ability and training. We can often find something about the country's history overseas by looking at occupations as well. Anywhere that jobs are recorded, you can find an insight into what the nation is doing at that point, because there are some things, as I mentioned, that always exist, like teachers, like ministers. But if you look at, for instance, the asylum admission registers, we can see tea planters, gold diggers, indigo planters, all evidence of lives lived in other countries and all that goes alongside that. We can also see it in correspondence and in a wealth of other records. And all of that continues through time. You know, we jobs come into being as a result of changing circumstances. And likewise, they're lost as a result of changing circumstance. So it might be that as a nation, we've, we've acquired land, which of course we have done many a time in our history. And um, so for instance, in the Caribbean, we start seeing plantation owners. If we have a changing policy, so when we started sending uh, convicts to Australia, we suddenly needed people to, to man those ships who we hadn't needed before. Ch changing technology is a big one. And of course, war and conflict. So for instance, in World War I and World War II, jobs were created as things were needed. So tanks were first used in battle in 1916. So presumably before 1916, we didn't have a huge um, requirement for tank drivers, but then suddenly we did, and so a job comes into existence. Similarly, in World War II, for instance, as radar was developed and increased, people were needed to operate that, and so they would take the skills from those other professions and bring it into a new emerging market. 
we didn't need Enigma code breakers until we did need them. Um, speaking of code breaking, uh, there are some other jobs where you might need to do a bit of code breaking to have a look. So quite often in censuses or other records, occupations will be abbreviated. So you will, the most common ones are MS and FS for male servant and female servant. Not as someone once said to me, but it says US and he went to America. So that's definitely what that is. I was like, that's not why it was written on the, the census. It's definitely MS for male servant, FS for female servant, AG lab for agricultural labourer, JP for justice of the peace. So there are some that are very common, but you might also find a CLK for a clerk, a GLVR for a glover. There are some that I thought, you're not making that much shorter. You probably could have just written the whole word. LDRS for laundress, STN for station master, VICT for victualler, someone who supplies food and provisions. And a very useful guide into the abbreviations you might come across can be found on the website Scotland's Places, a website I've sung the praises of many a time. For some jobs, you can find more detailed information. So for instance, if you are researching a particular nurse or you want to know about healthcare in a certain era, then there may be training registers within a particular healthcare archive, so a health board archive. So for instance, we have these at the, the Highland Archive Centre. The NHS Highland Records will give details of training of nurses and porters and so on. Teachers, I've spoken about before, if you're interested in the teaching profession and what the job might have entailed, you might find that information within school board records. For the incorporated trades or the crafts, so in Inverness there were six incorporated trades, the tailors, the bakers, the hammermen, the carpenters, the masons and the skinners. And for those incorporated trades uh, and the guilds and so on, you might find apprentice registers or indenture registers, correspondence and minutes. And we hold some fantastic papers relating to, to, to this. You might have seen um, yesterday, the day before yesterday, I posted up a, a document that I had come across while researching for this of um, the, the incorporated trades agreeing to let their daughters take the trades up. Really interesting. So we hold some fantastic papers relating to these trades. So for instance, the Inverness Borough indentures and the indentures are the apprentice registers from 1738 to uh, 1846. These give the names of the apprentice, the name of the master, the length of service they'll be undertaking, the date that it's been signed. There are also minute, um, minutes of the meetings, lists of, of members, petitions. You could go, and I did, right down a rabbit hole with this subject. And so I thought, rather than try and shove all that into here, I'm going to do a separate Learn with Lorna on the incorporated trades and the guilds because it was it was just so interesting when I started to go into it. And like I say, I went absolutely down a rabbit hole. Sometimes, regardless of what someone's occupation is, their, their main given job, you can find records of work that's been given to them under specific circumstances. So for instance, if someone is the, in the asylum, they might go in as a, um, a butler, but while they're in there, they'll be given specific jobs to do. I mentioned that sometimes people would be listed as pauper under their occupation. And sometimes if they're in the poor house, they might still have an occupation listed, but it's really the address there that, that's the relevant thing, telling you they're a pauper and they would still have an occupation. Um, so for instance, the poor house had in 1881, soldiers, nursery maids, domestic servants, grocers, all sorts of things. But when we look at the those kind of similar lists that you might think for the asylum, where people are put with a mental health problem as opposed to just with poverty, we'll see that people's occupations are listed there. And there's everything from Bible readers and butlers to doctors and domestic servants. Um, but according to Mary Souter, so Mary Souter is uh, a lovely lady who's come in and done some research with us to towards her, um, her degree with the University of Highlands and Islands, and she's focused on the asylum records. And in her final uh, dissertation, she wrote, which you can find online, I can put a link up to that if you're interested. She said that the vast majority of people who went into the asylum were working. They weren't unemployed, unlike the poor house and many people would be unemployed. The vast majority of people who went into the asylum had an occupation. But when they got in there, of course, they couldn't 
necessarily do what their occupation was, but they were given some kind of work to do. And so we can see evidence of both their actual occupation and what they did while they were in as part of their care and to contribute towards the upkeep of the institution. So they might work in the laundry, they might work on the farm. Um, sometimes they would do work that tied in with their actual, actual occupation. So they would use their skills, like cobblers and tailors, would, leave, would use their skills to teach other uh, in, um, patients to, to have a skill that they could take out with them. I had a long chat yesterday about this. I was working in the prison yesterday, um, kind of speaking to a lot of the guys in the prison about mental health and mental health records. And we had a, a lot of conversation around this, around the ability to learn new skills when you're in the system. And of course, any big institution like the asylum, like the poor house, aside from the occupations given to the patients, they also need a variety of staff that you don't find elsewhere. So the hospital, which prior to the construction of the asylum in 1846, the hospital, which housed a few uh, lunatics at the time before the specific asylum was built, they had jobs for their staff, including nurses, porters, servants and attendants, but also some jobs that we would not call anybody now, uh, the female maniacs attendant and the keeper of maniacs which is a very uncomfortable term, it sounds like zookeeper, but I suspect it's more like a housekeeper, it's the person who's keeping and caring for them. So sometimes jobs are given according to what the organisation needs, as well as what they think might be good for you to do. So it's not, that's not your chosen profession, your chosen occupation, it's just that at that moment in time, the organisation would like you to do this, because it's to their benefit, but also they think it's to your benefit in some way. And on a smaller scale, this is a bit like the jobs given to scouts and guides. Not a chosen job, but little jobs given to them when needed. So for instance, Bob a Job Week. Now Jen and other people in Australia, I'll be interested to know if you had an equivalent of Bob a Job Week. So in Nucleus, we hold uh, the records of uh, various scout troops and in, in amongst those collections are Bob a Job cards and they detail the jobs given to scouts during Bob a, uh, Bob a Job week, which was to raise money. So each scout would have their own card and they would do whatever jobs were given to them and they would receive a bob for them, which is a shilling, my mother uh, confidently assures me. Around about five pence, I think. So each, each scout would take their card and they would uh, record all the jobs that they had done and the amount that they had earned for them. And here are the instructions on the Bob a Job uh, cards. To the giver of the job, when the caller has completed the allotted task to your satisfaction, kindly enter the nature of the job done and the amount paid over to him on the inside of this card. All money earned during Bob a Job week will be devoted entirely to the benefit of scouting. The only reward the boy himself will get is the satisfaction of knowing that he has done a good job for you and for his group. Thank you. To the cub or scout. 1. Tackle only the jobs you know you can do well. 2. Pass on those you feel you cannot do to someone who can. 3. Wear your uniform whenever you can. If it's not possible, then see that your badge is visible. 4. Avoid calling on any house displaying the yellow job done sign. Ask your scouter for a supply of these signs. One should be handed over to every person who gives you a job. Make sure that all jobs and amounts are entered onto this card. 6. Take good care not to lose your job card, lest it should fall into wrong hands. Write your name and address below. And finally, remember a scout is always courteous. Never forget your please and thank you, even if your call does not bring forth a job. Uh, quite fun. So for instance, James Harold in 1966, we can see that he did jobs including washing windows, chopping sticks, going for the messages, so going for the shopping, cleaning cars, tidying gardens and feeding chickens. He did 20 jobs that week and he earned £1.8 shillings because some people gave him more than a bob for them. That seemed like quite a good return to me. So you can see uh, from the kind of big things of the census uh, accumulated collated data to the asylum to those little jobs within the scout records that are references to jobs and occupations and 
kind of general money making activities are everywhere through our collections and of course they are because that's what you know the bulk of, of people are doing is is doing something with their time um teaching and working and sharing and their knowledge but i wanted to finish off by coming back to the census records and some of the fun things that you can find in them just because it, it made me laugh out loud so i thought i would share them i found one person in the census who listed their occupation as i just do what i can there's a 15 year old girl in the 1880 us census whose occupation is listed as she does whatever she pleases. It's interesting that all her brothers and sisters are recorded as at home. So you maybe get a sense of her personality that she's recorded as does whatever she pleases. This goes to a whole other level in the 1911 census because for the first time, um, there was, in, in some areas, people were able to, householders could complete their own census returns rather than telling information to uh, an enumerator. And so that's when we start to see people adding in pet dogs, cats and mice in their household members. So, for instance, Ernest Ladbrook put in his cat Bob. He said that Bob's occupation was a nomad mouse handler. And William Chubb, he put his dog in, Bresto. He said he was born in Yorkshire. He was single with no children. He had no infirmities and his occupation was a watchdog. Those are from the um, English census returns as is this one that I wanted to finish on. The entry for Richard Otty in Leeds. I came across this in a blog post written by Leaves Family History uh, Research. And they record that sometimes the occupations can also be transcribed wrongly. So they might be very clear within the census, but when they've been transcribed and put onto a website, they might not be quite as clear. So they found Richard Otty listed as prostitute machinist missionary, which they thought probably he wouldn't have been that happy about because when they went back to the original, he was in fact a primitive, primitive Methodist minister. So that made me laugh out loud. I hope you found that interesting. Like I say, no great revelations in today's talk, just uh, sharing some of the interesting things I've come across and some of my ponderings about different occupations. Thank you for joining me though. I hope you can join me next week. I will be looking at the Taylor of Monlochy collection, which is a collection of records we hold in the Highland Archives Centre relating to a family and a business in Monlochy. So I hope you can join me next week. A reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're really grateful. Thank you so much for joining me.